Welcome to our regular weekly Bible study program. Thank you for your interest in God's Holy Word. Thank you for joining us. We always begin our Bible studies with a brief word of prayer, asking the Lord to touch our minds, to cause us to see what He's telling us out of His Word, to open our hearts to receive the good Word of God. So would you join me in a brief prayer here tonight? Our dear righteous Lord, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, the one who purchased our redemption on the cross. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be servants of God. Thank you for your saving grace, for reaching down in love and mercy and extending to us that wonderful salvation that we have received. Thank you for giving us a vision of the work of God in the body of Christ, for adding us to that wonderful work of God. Thank you for bringing us in, either out of the world or out of the religious Babylon, to be a part of this great work. We pray that you would touch our minds here tonight, help us that we might understand what you're telling us out of your word. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, we've just finished an in-depth study of the book of Romans over the last nine or ten weeks. But tonight we revert back to our original format of questions and answers. I've had people submit their Bible questions to us and we're going to do our best to try to address as many of those as we can in the time allotted tonight. Uh, if you've submitted questions that we don't get to tonight, rest assured that we won't lose them. We will uh, proceed to those in an upcoming Bible study. But if you have a question that is burning on your heart and you need an answer tonight, feel free to submit that question while this broadcast is live streamed. You can send it in as a comment to this Facebook post and we will do our best to answer it. Otherwise, any time after this, you can submit the question either as a comment again on this Facebook post or you can send it uh, to us as a message on our church Facebook page. But we do appreciate your questions. Shows me that people are interested in what the Lord has to say out of his holy word. So I'll begin with the question I received. All of these were received recently or during the time we were going through the book of Romans. But the first question is, what is holiness and how does it differ from righteousness? And I can simplify it by saying that holiness is what we are and righteousness is what we do. But I think that needs further explanation. Being holy means being set apart for God. That means being separated for God's own purpose, for God's own use. The word holy can be used for objects, like a holy altar. It can be used for time, like a holy day. Or it can be used for persons, like a holy priest. But all believers who are born again in Jesus Christ are set apart for God. Therefore, they have been made holy or sanctified, which has the same meaning. And they've been made that way through Holy Ghost baptism, through new birth. And so the saints of the Most High God, the servants of the Most High God, are not holier than thou. I, I don't mean that but they are holy in that they've been separated from the world and from the organized religious world for God's own use and purpose. And that's why God's chosen and saved people are called saints in the Bible. The word isn't used in the Bible the way the Roman Catholic Church would use it today where somebody is super uh, spiritual and, and is dead and after being dead and performing miracles, they can become uh, beautified and become a saint, and then it, now it's St. Christopher or St. Peter or St. Uh, whoever. No, every blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God is called a saint in the Bible. That word saint is in the New Testament, or in, no, the entire Bible. They're called saints in the Old Testament too, but in the entire Bible, uh, the word saint appears some 96 times. And it always refers to the Lord's people every time it's used. But in the New Testament, the word saint comes from the Greek word hagios, H-A-G-I-O-S, which means consecrated to God or holy or sacred. Uh, it's translated, that word hagios 
It's translated as saint or saints a little over 60 times in the New Testament. But that same Greek word, hagios, is translated as holy a hundred times more, 168 times in the New Testament. So the word holy and the word saint in the Bible both mean set apart for God, and it applies to the followers of Christ, to the servants of the Lord. So holiness then means being chosen by God and set apart from sin and sinners for the Lord's own use and work. Now the word righteous means doing the right things. To be righteous means you do what's right. It means that our actions are right, our motives are pure, our lifestyle is in conformity to the moral law of God. So to simplify, righteousness would be refraining from sin. And it's important to note, however, that our righteousness will not save us. That's the primary theme of the book of Romans, and we've gone through that in great detail in uh, the last several weeks here. But Paul did tell the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And I think it's the next verse that says, Not of works lest any man should boast. Um, and so our response to grace is to do our very best to be right, to be righteous in all of our thoughts and deeds. Paul told the Romans in Romans 6 and verse 13, he said, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, to summarize, holiness is being set apart for God's work, and righteousness is doing the right thing, not sinning, not transgressing God's moral law. Um, and then I can throw this in, godliness is being more godlike in our thoughts, in our motives, in our uh, inner man, to become more godly is godliness. So there's holiness, which means God has chosen you and set you apart from the world and apart from, from other things for his purpose. Righteousness is doing the right thing, and godliness is developing the attitudes in the spirit of God, the compassion, the love, those kind of things that God has. My former pastor, Brother James Souders, used to talk about us duplicating God in all of his duplicatable ways. There's some things about God we cannot duplicate, but there's a lot about God that we can duplicate in our lives. All right, the next question says, in your online Bible class, please comment on Revelation 11, verse 13, and thank you. Well, Revelation 11:13 13 says, and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now that's the second of three woes that were pronounced earlier back in chapter 8, verse 13. And I believe the entire context of the 13th chapter, pardon me, the entire context of the 11th chapter of Revelation is about the last prophetic hour, events that are going to occur at the very end of Gentile times. It's a time of plagues and judgment that leads up to Armageddon and the return of our Lord. So in interpreting the book of Revelation, or really any end time prophecy, I always start by considering whether there's a literal fulfillment to those words before assuming there's some spiritual or symbolic application. When we conclude quickly that things are all symbolic, then we gain control of the interpretation. We can make any interpretation we want to fit that symbol. You know, for example, I can say that a rock is symbolic and it symbolizes Christ. Or I can say a rock is symbolic and it symbolizes an obstacle. I can make fire a symbol of life or a symbol of destruction. I can make fire a symbol of the Holy Ghost or a symbol of hell. 
So symbolic language is subject to the interpreter's interpretation. So I try to be careful. Some things are clearly symbolic. A beast with seven heads and ten horns must be symbolic because there is no living animal on earth that has seven heads and ten horns. But sometimes we need to start with a consideration of whether the scripture is showing us something that's literal or something that's symbolic. And I begin by considering if the prophecy simply means what it says. And the earthquake in verse 13 of chapter 11 of Revelation could be a natural, literal earthquake. The city that it talks about is the city of Rome. It's mentioned in verse 8. Um, and it's part of end time events. And the fact that one tenth of the city is destroyed and 7,000 men, not counting women and children, perish would point to a pretty massive earthquake. And the Vatican City is included inside what is now the city of Rome. And maybe this prophecy means the destruction of that tenth part of the city of Rome. An earthquake destroying Vatican buildings would be highly significant in that last prophetic hour. But I will acknowledge that there may be a symbolic and spiritual meaning for this verse. An earthquake is a symbol of commotion, of agitation, of change of great political revolutions, and etc. And maybe there's a spiritual shaking of Babylon, that great city, during the time of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Maybe the rapture of the bride of Christ and the end time effect of the church will be like an earthquake. Maybe this is when Revelation 18.4 comes to pass, where it says, To come out of her, my people. And there's a great exodus out of Babylon, so that at the end of the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, you see that there's no more, uh, no more voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters and craftsmen, and, and the sound of the millstone is heard no more, and the light of a candle shines no more in her, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride are heard no more in her. Maybe that's what this great shaking is all about. Um, Maybe it means that, uh, that Babylon is losing power and influence, the power to persecute, the power to influence nations, etc. Maybe it's losing control of the ten kings that are prophesied in the book of Revelation because we read later that they, those ten kings hate the whore and burn her with fire in Revelation seventeen sixteen, And the 7,000 men slain might mean that God is involved in finishing the work. Seven is the symbolic number of completion, like there's seven days in a week, seven feasts of the Lord, etc. And seven times 1,000 would imply full finality. And Babylon was beginning to fall, and the fullness of the finality and the fullness of the judgment of God is beginning to hit Babylon when Revelation 11:13 comes to pass. But I will say I kind of favor the literal interpretation. I think some of these dramatic events told to us in the book of Revelation are going to actually happen just like it says it's going to happen. And that's where I come from on that prophecy. But thank you for the question. Next question that I got uh, said, If the Holy Ghost is the only way for us to reach perfection, how was Jesus sinless? his entire time on the earth. Well, I'll tell you, I don't believe Jesus needed to receive the Holy Ghost as a gift like you and I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's because Jesus was a product of the Holy Ghost. That's how he was conceived in Mary's womb. See, human DNA, which is found in every one of our cells, uh, except an egg and a sperm cell, but human DNA always has 46 chromosomes. But Mary's earthly body could only produce an egg cell that has just 23 chromosomes. Since she was a virgin, where did the other 23 chromosomes come from? They had to be supplied by the power of God. They had to be supplied by the Holy Ghost. It brought in the other 23 chromosomes, which linked to Mary's 23 chromosomes, to form a fertilized egg. 
and that fertilized cell then began to replicate and differentiate into the body of Jesus, first as an embryo, then as a fetus, and finally as a full-born child. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now Jesus was born of the Spirit in a way that no other human has ever been born. The Holy Ghost was a part of him from conception. We're born without it. And at some point in our lives, we received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I received it on June the 10th, 1967. But I was already 10 years old at that point. Um, Jesus was born as a product of the Holy Ghost. It was in him. Isaiah 42 in verse 1 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. See, God put his spirit there at conception. We receive a measure of the Holy Ghost in spirit baptism, but it's only a measured amount of that wonderful spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. But Jesus did not have just a measure of the Holy Ghost. He did not have just a limited amount of it. John 3 in verse 34 says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the word of God. For God giveth not him the spirit, pardon me, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. It wasn't just a measured amount. He had the unlimited power of the Holy Ghost. He did not receive that when he was baptized. Um, he was already born of the Spirit. He was already the Son of God. He did not need to be born again. He was already born as God's own Son. And the dove that descended on Jesus was only symbolic of the fact that he was being anointed into the ministry at that point. Because it was then that he began his public ministry. And his first message preached in Nazareth was that the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel. He said that in Luke 4 and verse 18. The dove descending was not Holy Ghost baptism. It was a symbol of God's anointing and a recognition of the beginning of Christ's public ministry. And we still anoint men to the ministry today with oil sometimes. We don't see doves descend, but we do try to recognize God's anointing on someone who has been called to preach the gospel. But the Holy Ghost baptism wasn't something Jesus needed when he turned age 30. He did not need that to overcome sin like you and I do. He had never sinned up to that point in his life. We need the Holy Ghost to wash away our sins. But Jesus had no sins to wash away. Perhaps that was because for 30 years he knew he was already empowered by the Spirit that formed him in the womb. Now the next question follows up in this vein and says, When Jesus was 30, he was baptized and the dove came. Why does the Bible not talk about Jesus talking in tongues? And I'm not sure I really know the answer to this question. At least I don't think I can give you an authoritative answer. I do believe that redeemed sinners speak in other tongues when they receive the Holy Ghost, probably because the tongue is just so evil and so unruly. James, the third chapter, verses 5 and 6 say, Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Boy, James didn't have anything good to say about the human tongue, that it's a, it's a world of iniquity. It defiles the body. 
And the sins that you and I have committed with our words, those sins need to be purged. Our old nature led us into all kinds of statements, poisonous statements and hurtful words. And James continued on in verse 8 of chapter 3 by saying, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> an unruly evil full of deadly poison. But in Holy Ghost baptism, we sinners have to surrender our tongue. We have to surrender our speaking capability to the Lord and let his spirit take over and begin to form words and languages that we had never learned. But Jesus was different. He had never sinned. In no way can his tongue be called an unruly evil. His words never defiled him. If he spoke in tongues, and that was recorded, that it might have caused some people to believe he was a sinner who needed redemption and salvation like you and I do. But he didn't need that. He had never sinned. And for us, speaking in other tongues is evidence that the Spirit now resides in us. But that Spirit always resided in Christ from conception. Luke 4 and verse 14 speaks of Jesus walking in the power of the Spirit. And I'm sure he did from day one. Even as a child, he knew that he must be about his father's business. He was already a son of God. We're adopted into the family of God by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was already God's son from very conception. So that's the best I can do on those questions. Let me move on to, to the next one. It says, please explain Matthew 22 verses 1 through 14, and especially verses 10 through 13. Well, Matthew 22, the first 14 verses, are a parable that Jesus gave about this king who was preparing a wedding feast for his, his son, his beloved son. And invitations went out, and those who, who were invited did not come. And so he sent out and invited others who you might think were unworthy, but he wanted to have that wedding feast be a joyous occasion for his son. Now, it's a parable, but Jesus was telling us a story here. He was saying God was this great king that was preparing a feast for his son Jesus. And the invited guests, the Jews, if they would have accepted Jesus as Messiah, then it truly would have been a wonderful celebration. But history tells us, of course, that Jesus was rejected. They said, crucify him. Um, John 1 and verse 11 says that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. And that parable is where Jesus is recounting that entire history of the Jewish people. In verse 3, it says that this king sent forth servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, but they would not come. Um, Moses and Joshua and others, they offered them the promised land and the blessings of Deuteronomy 28. But the people went into idolatry in the book of Judges. And the entire Old Testament history shows you a struggle to keep the children of Israel worshiping the true God when they kept wanting to worship idols, Baal and Ashtoreth and all these others. In verse 4, it says again, he sent forth other servants, telling, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlands are killed. All things are ready, come unto the marriage. See, there were great prophets that the Lord sent, like Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and others, and they invited the people into a proper relationship with God so they could receive their Messiah. But they ignored God's spokesman, verse 5, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, uh, and even worse, they began to persecute and uh, even kill these prophets that the Lord sent. That's verse 6. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Um, <laughs> wow. I think Paul referred to that in 
the 11th chapter of Hebrews in verse 36 when he mentioned some of those others who had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain of the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Um, Elijah spent time in a cave until he heard a still small voice. Non-biblical history tells us that Elijah was sawn in two. Uh, these were persecuted and, and slain, just as this parable applies. And then it becomes very prophetic at verse 7. It says, But the king heard thereof, when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their cities. I believe this is foretelling the horrible judgment of God that fell on Jerusalem when Titus, the Roman general, destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple that was there in the year 70 AD. And so in verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Um, See, the originally invited guests, the Jews, were not worthy. So verses 8, 9, and even verse 10 says, Those servants went out to the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. That's the gathering in of the Gentiles. God turned to the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Um, it foretells a Gentile church. But in this church, there's going to be both bad and good. And it's been that way for 2,000 years, both bad and good. But all of this leads up to that wedding, that great feast that inaugurates the millennial reign of Christ. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19 and verse 9. But not everyone is going to be allowed to participate in that marriage supper. There are some qualifications. The bad will not be admitted. And so this is getting us up to the specific verses that were questioned here. Verse 11, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Verse 12, And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Um, I believe the wedding garment symbolizes Holy Spirit baptism. See, Revelation 19 and verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of saints. See, that fine linen is the wedding garment. You've got to have not your own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is imputed unto you. It's a garment that's given to you. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 9 that he desired to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And I again tell you, that is Holy Ghost baptism. That's when you get that wedding garment. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11 says, and after talking about all the evil in the human heart, he said, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It takes that Spirit to wash you and to justify you and to sanctify you. So perhaps Matthew twenty two twelve statement that that without a garment that man was speechless. Maybe there's a hint there that the evidence of spirit baptism is speaking, speaking in other tongues. And so we get to the crucial verse here. Then said the king, verse thirteen, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, and take him away and cast him into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Boy, wouldn't it be sad to miss out on the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
The binding is the man's own refusal to accept the plan of God and to seek spirit baptism. Uh, many, thousands, yea, millions, uh, are rejecting that call. Many are called, but few are chosen. The weeping and gnashing of teeth just means that there's remorse, that you can't be apart. And the outer darkness is to be outside of the plan of God, to be outside of his great salvation. And spe specifically, the beginning of the millennium, which starts out small but grows, Egypt and Syria reach out to the Lord and then all the nations. But to be on the outside of that great transformation of the earth into the paradise of God, oh, that's a very dark place to be. Now, this parable doesn't necessarily mean that that man is bound for the second death. It's just that at that point, in the opening days of the 1,000-year reign of Christ, there will be persons who are not justified, who are not sanctified, who are not baptized with the Holy Ghost, and they're not eligible to participate in the joy of the Lord right then. But I have to wonder if maybe, perhaps, during that 1,000 years, those persons, or at least some of them, will come to accept the plan of God and the salvation that he offers. I think People are going to start reaching out to the Lord when they see that what they didn't understand before is real and that Jesus is ruling over a millennial kingdom. At least I believe they're going to have that wonderful opportunity. Take a breath. Next question that was submitted to me asked, can a brother in the body of Christ own a gun? Now, I'm not going to deal with the legal issues of that. There may be laws in each person's locality that deal with gun ownership. But I'll have to say I do personally know many brothers who own guns, and they're part of the body of Christ. Many of them are avid hunters. They go out hunting, just as some of the others are fishermen who like to fish. Um, and I don't really see where anyone who regularly eats meat can have too big of a problem with someone who hunts wild game and eats what they shoot. But maybe that's not what the questioner is wanting to know. Maybe he's asking or she's asking whether a saint of God can own a gun for personal protection. Would it be right in the sight of God to point a gun at another human being and squeeze the trigger and end their life? Um, I have to say that this might be a question more appropriately addressed to your own pastor if you're in a church in the body of Christ. I can only give the answer that I would give to the saints that are part of my ministry here in Des Moines. Um, you know, it's a complicated question. The early church did not try to defend themselves against persecutors. They didn't buy swords, and when people came to arrest them, take them to the arenas, they didn't pull out their swords and try to fight off the soldiers. And I think if you're being persecuted for the name of Christ, if you are being physically attached, attacked for Christ and the gospel, maybe then it would not be right to defend yourself with lethal weapons. Maybe at that point you have to submit to whatever comes it came in horrible misery and pain to the members of the early church as they were drawn into coliseums and, and terribly, terribly mutilated and killed. But sometimes we might be attacked not because of the gospel's sake, but just by deranged persons or people with evil intent or people breaking into your home to, to do great damage. You know, if the attacker's deranged or somebody seeking to abduct your children um, or rape your wife, you might be justified in taking action, at least in that moment, never later as an act of revenge, but in that moment to defend and protect life. Um, and maybe the questioner is asking about a handgun, a pistol, a revolver, an automatic handgun or something like that. I will tell you, I do know this, that a handgun in the hands of an untrained person is a very dangerous uh, thing to have. 
in the stress of a situation like that, if you are not an expert with a handgun, it is very hard in the nervous condition to aim accurately and actually hit what you're aiming at. And the danger is that you might hurt someone else. A nine millimeter bullet will penetrate interior house walls and could injure or kill somebody else in another room because you missed your target and the bullet went through into the bedroom of a child and struck them. Um, you know, if we're talking personal protection and if you feel that it's right in your soul and in your conscience before God to have weaponry to defend yourself and you're not going to practice and become somewhat expert in how to use it, then probably the safest thing for you is to have a shotgun because a shotgun shoots a scattered pattern. You don't have to aim accurately. You just point it in the general direction of the person. And if you pull that trigger with a 12 or even a 20 gauge shotgun, that person probably is not going to be getting back up. Um, the pellets probably won't penetrate other walls and do damage to other persons. So it's probably a much better protection than trying to, to uh, in your nervous condition, point a handgun and pull a trigger. I'll tell you that a cheap but non-lethal defense is just a can of wasp spray. Those wasp sprays will shoot 12 to even 20 feet away. And once you get some of that in an attacker's eyes, they can't point and shoot. They can't do much of anything. It's a very, um, you know, you can sure take them down by that point or flee. So I don't really want to give a, a hard and fast answer that would apply to everyone in the body of Christ. That's far above my pay grade. Um, I think that owning a gun for protection might be acceptable if it doesn't violate your conscience. And if you're using it uh, to protect someone else, uh, a spouse, a child, uh, someone that you're responsible for. But I don't think it's ever going to be right or appropriate to stockpile munitions in order to defend ourselves when true persecution comes. If there's martyrdom uh, for the name of Christ, your witness as you go um, is, is such that you did not defend yourself any more than Stephen defended himself when they were stoning him. He did not pick up the rocks and start throwing back. But he opened his eyes and saw the Lord standing at the right hand of his father. And he knew that he was going to be all right, even though his earthly life was ending, that there was going to be eternal life with the Lord. Sister Julia, do we have a question that's come in? Who is eligible to baptize today? Who is eligible to baptize today? I presume we're talking of water baptism. And really... I think the Bible makes it pretty clear that you have to be a spirit-filled uh, minister of the gospel in the body of Christ to be able to validly uh, water baptize. I will turn to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts um, to answer this question. Um, we learn about Apollos in the 18th chapter, he was a Jew, he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, he was in fervent in the spirit, and he taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John, John the baptizer. And in chapter 18, verse 26, Aquila and Priscilla found him and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They told him about the ministry of Christ. He didn't know that Jesus had come, that John wasn't the the last great move of God, that something more had happened and that the Holy Ghost had fallen. And so uh, he was there in Ephesus. And in, then chapter 19, Paul, the apostle, comes to Ephesus in verse 1. And he found certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, We don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost. These were the disciples of, of Apollos, the man who was eloquent and mighty in the scriptures, telling people about John the Baptist. And then, so Paul asked them in verse 3, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. That makes it clear who they are. 
And he said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Um, but then he said that there was one after that, Christ Jesus. And it says in verse 5, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized with John's baptism, but that wasn't valid. They needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus. They were baptized again. Some of the translations and transliterations, like the Living Bible, says they were baptized again. And then Paul laid hands on them, and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost and spake with other tongues. But this scripture indicates to me that you have to be a God-called man in the body of Christ, like the Apostle Paul was, to baptize somebody right. If the person is operating under any other covering. See, the head of every man is Christ. And uh, if anyone has a different covering than Christ, then they cannot baptize. If your authority to baptize persons comes from a man-made organization, an incorporated denomination, and, and these big church denominations grant licenses and authority to baptize, but that authority comes from the organization. And Paul didn't have that. His authority came from Jesus Christ. And so it has to be a man of God operating under the direct headship of Jesus Christ and not under the authority of a supervising ministry or a state overseer or a bishop or cardinal, but it has to be one who's operating under the headship of Jesus Christ. And those are the people who've been authorized by Jesus to administer water baptism. He told his disciples to baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost. And Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38 to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And so that's what the church, the true church does that operates not under the headship of men and a magisterium, but a church that operates under the authority of Jesus Christ, the only true head of the church. Amen. One more question. Who do we pray to? Is it God the Father, or is it the Lord Jesus, or could we pray to both? Well, I'll say this. Technically, we should pray to God the Father. We have that access through Jesus Christ. But before I explain that, let me say this. Jesus, help me, is a perfectly acceptable prayer, especially in a crisis. But Jesus did tell us, he taught us how to pray. They asked him how to pray, and he told them. And the Lord's Prayer is recorded for us in Matthew 6, 9. He said, I pray then like this. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven. Every time Jesus prayed, he prayed to the Father. Um, he never told his disciples, Pray unto me. He said, You've asked nothing in my name, but if you'll ask the Father, now he'll grant your requests. Um, and it's, though we address those prayers to God the Father, we address them to him through the right of access Jesus gave us. We can come, Hebrews says, boldly to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. Uh, Jesus is the mediator. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. He said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. But we, we do ask the Father, we always ask it in Jesus' name. John 16 and verse 26 says, At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and you have believed me that I came from God. So Jesus is saying you can go directly to God the Father. Isn't that awesome? We go directly to God the Father uh, in the name of Jesus. And uh, he hears our petitions and our requests. And so that the best answer I can give to you is that, yes, we should pray directly to the Father through Jesus Christ, our Son, or His Son, God's own Son. Now, I have a couple of more questions, but I'm out of time. I will save these for the next time we have this Bible study, and we'll address them then. But I'll need more questions, so if you have Bible questions that you would like to hear us address in this program, please go ahead and submit them as a comment to this Facebook page, 
or send it as a message uh, to our church Facebook account and we'll do our best to address your Bible questions in a future Bible study program. In the meantime, thank you for your interest and may the Lord be with you through the coming days. Amen.